So I typically try to base a lot of my videos around something that can be helpful for a lot of people. But for this video, I kind of wanted to do something different and just talk about my research, which isn't very helpful for a lot of people, but maybe it'll be informative. And I really just wanted to make a well-documented video of all of my research that I have done up to this point. So I'm a physics major. I just finished my freshman year at Rutgers and I am part of a particle physics research group that is working on data from the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And in particular, I'm working as part of a company called CMS. They do a lot of things. They do data acquisition. So actually gathering the data at the Large Hadron Collider and disperse it to various laboratories and universities for analysis groups like the one that I'm in to actually run analysis on. There are many particles and various things in these events that you can study. You can study what's called QCD jets, muons, but for me, I'm studying the dye tau. So there's various particles that decay to two taus, the Higgs, the phi particle, I think, the Z boson, that's particularly the data that I'm working on right now, the Z boson into two taus. But the reason my research is important at all is because of something that's called fake taus. So in order to sort of lead up to what a fake tau is, I'm gonna describe some things that go on in the detector itself when a particle collision happens. So the LHC and the data that I'm working on right now starts with a bunch of protons that just are flying at each other at near light speed. And out of all those photons, not all of them collide, but there might be a few that do collide. So say that one of these or two of these protons collide, then right here is the event vertice. So each collision is really called an event when you actually store it in data. So this one event or collision has a bunch of particles and jets that spew out of it. Among some of those particles is the Z boson, for example. And say the Z boson flies over here and it decays into two taus. Taus have a very short lifespan. So those taus are gonna decay very quickly into a pion prong, it's called, which is just a set of pion particles. And maybe the other tau will decay into a muon, along with neutrinos and photons. But the point is that only the end products, the final decay products of that interaction, the Z to die tau, and then all of these other particles that spew out of the taus, only those final particles will be detected in the detector. The tau just decays too fast because it's, first of all, it's the heaviest lepton, so it's pretty unstable. So these particles are what's detected. To an observer that's just seeing this data stream in from the detector, all we are seeing is a bunch of pions and a muon, and maybe some photon, the uh, energy deposits from a photon as well. So we actually don't know that it comes from a tau, but there's various algorithms that work on these particles and sort of try to deduce that it came from two taus and possibly a boson, but they're not always accurate because of these things called fake taus. So let me give you an example of how something might fake a tau. So there's a particle called, just off the top of my head, there's a particle called the J-Psi and the J side decays into two muons, right? So say a muon, one of the muons flies this way, and then due to some other decay, a bunch of pions fly this way as well. And they land right next to each other, just close enough and just in the right way with the right momentum and uh, other attributes that they kind of look like a tau. They kind of look like they could have came from a tau particle, but in reality, they didn't but that doesn't matter because the algorithm will take these attributes and combinatorically build them up to two taus and say that those two taus came from a Z. So then we have a problem when we analyze the data because once we plot all of these decay products that we say we came from a tau into a mass distribution, we'll have like a normal Gaussian distribution centered around the mass of the tau. And we're like, okay, that makes sense. It came from a tau particle, right? That's what we hoped the algorithm, which is rebuilding the decay products into a tau, was gonna do. But then we also have some little bump over here that looks like it has a mass of something different. So did we discover a new particle or is there some defect in the algorithm that is rebuilding these 
uh, decay products into these taus? The answer is most likely the latter, that there's a defect in the algorithm. So in reality, the accuracy of this algorithm in determining taus from these decay products is really bad. It's maybe just above 50%, which I don't want to say that's bad because for what the tau is, that's actually pretty good, I'd say. But it still isn't really that good. We would want it to be better. Um, so that's where my research comes into play. So for the past few weeks, I've really just been doing a lot of preparation for the main project, which I've just recently started. And that preparation included writing C code to handle the data in such a way that it forms training data. So training data is used for training deep learning or machine learning models. So my research right now is focused on building such a machine learning model that it can take in one of these um, groups of decay constituents and accurately determine if it came from a tau particle or not. And I should have mentioned, but just to uh, make some wording easier, in this like sort of cone of all these particles that are spewing from the Z, so you have the Z and then the, the two taus come out of the, the Z and then the two taus decay into a bunch of things. Those collectively, all those particles are referred to as a jet. So a bunch of particles that came from the same thing are referred to as a jet. So that would be a tau jet. So we're feeding the model these jet objects and hopefully it will determine with higher accuracy than the combinatorical algorithm that's used right now, whether or not the jet is a tau jet or some other jet, maybe like a jet from the JSI and something else. So I will say that that might sound very exciting to like the physics major who just started or some high school student, because I know that would have sounded very exciting to me when I was like before I started this research, but I may have glorified it a little bit because that plan and all of that information that I just gave you, it, it sounds very exciting, but what research really is, is a lot of me coding and writing scripts and figuring out how software works. Um, in particular, in particle physics, some of this software that I'm using isn't necessarily well documented. Um, it like to be frank a lot of it really isn't well documented you need to talk to your colleagues to figure out how it works and then even then um some of my colleagues don't understand exactly how some of this software works so you have to do in-depth research to try to figure it out and there's even some guesswork to figure it out so it's definitely not easy but the end product having a machine learning model that is able to accurately determine whether a jet is a tau, and even more than that, is able to better determine it than the current acting algorithm and whatever other model is being used right now um, to determine whether a jet is a tau jet or not. That is what drives me to do some of the more basic or tedious work. So I think that covers it pretty well without getting like too, too in depth. I kind of would want to get more in depth with maybe another video, but if you have any questions about it, uh, feel free to ask them below. I'd love to answer questions about it. Um, one thing you'll find about physics professors and physics researchers is that they typically like to talk about their research because a lot of us are very like passionate about it. So that's all I have today and I'll see you in the next one.